Hi everybody, I think it's time for us to talk about self-help and happiness. So, a uh, big part of this class is that first paper and it really deals with uh, critical thinking, critically analyzing a, a self-help book. So one of your two books is a self-help book and a classic work. You know, if, if you're a super good shopper, and depending on what your choices are, both books can be had for like under 20 bucks for this course, right? And as I said in the last one, that the, these lectures, which will be available both in video form and just raw PowerPoint, are your textbook for the course, so to speak. So trying to help us adjust financially, if nothing else, and enhance our financial wellness. Let's talk about self-help and, and happiness. So the self-help movement. Or there's an app for that. So there you go. It's the search for direction. It's the search for helping us make the choices and, and being assured that we made the correct choices, right? And avoid the anxiety and the dissonance from perhaps have making a wrong choice when there's no clear answer whether it was a right or a wrong choice in the future. We look for someone who's willing to tell us that this is the right choice and that is the wrong choice. Well done or you suck, right? Are the outcomes, depending on what that authoritarian tells us about our choice, right? It's easy to become overwhelmed and we should never feel guilty or inferior or inadequate because we feel overwhelmed. It's part of being a human being, right? Uh, it's, it's normal to feel anxious and or confused under certain circumstances or in certain contexts. Domains in, in which help might be sought, typically people want to know about their relationships, improve their relationship, get into a relationship, get out of a relationship, whatever it is, and somehow uh, understand more about their relationship. Maybe it's identity and one's relationship with the self, right? Maybe it's a problems of communication and, and I want help with being able to communicate more effectively. Uh, maybe it's parenting, right? And one of the biggest sellers of books, my mom had this book on her shelf, was Dr. Spock. No, not Mr. Spock from Star Trek, but Dr. Spock. And it was about child rearing. And back, wait, in the late 50s, man, it was all about Dr. Spock and how to rear your child correctly, right? Parents are overwhelmed. They don't know what to do with their children, so they read Dr. Spock's book. And it was like the Bible of parenting at that point in time. Maybe we need help work, gaining promotions, gaining advancement, negotiating policies, whatever it is. Maybe we've faced some ethical dilemmas and we want help to understand how our choices could be construed as ethical or unethical. Or maybe not so much in this day and age. Never mind. All right. Uh, morality. What's moral and what isn't? And that's a really tough place to, to get advice, right? And, and adhere to the advice. Uh, personal growth. And a lot of people just want to grow. They want to become more than they are. Uh, they want to become better, wh whatever that vague term means. Right, sweetie? Yeah. Huh? All right. So self-help can take many forms, books, videos, organizations you can join, websites, cults, join a cult, right? Religion, these are all paths to self-help in one form or another. So the search for direction. Maybe it's the Silva method by Jose Silva, right? Tapping the secrets, right, out of the mind. Or, or getting it, psychology of Est. I was a victim of Est, if you will. Uh, my mom was a casting director uh, in Hollywood, and I grew up in the San Fernando Valley. My mom and dad were divorced, so from about the time I was four years old, it was my mom and I. I was an only child. She worked a lot, right? And uh, EST came to be, Earhart Seminar Training. Werner Earhart developed this method, this compilation of ideas that he stole from here, there, blended them all together. And I remember you go to a training and some hotel co ballroom, conference room, right? It was in downtown L.A. Uh, and we go there and you spend Saturday and Sunday. You get there at 8 a.m., you leave about 9 p.m., you do that Saturday, you do the same thing Sunday, and then you come back for the next weekend. And they're brutal. They break down your barriers, right? You got a trainer up there on the stage screaming at you. You're doing activities with the 300 people in the room you're sitting with. But you're going to get it. You're going to improve your being in the world, if you will, through this process. And a lot of it was just kind of recycled Buddhism uh, and some other components, right? It was uh, nothing all that creative. And then if that wasn't enough, paying 300 bucks in 1973, $300 for those two weekends, then you could sign up for 10-week, one-night courses after that. And I remember I did two of those 10-week courses, Be Here Now 
is that 70s or what be here now baba ram das time right and the second one 10 week course i took was what's so and, and of course they were so clever and so glib all the time because what's so once you understand what's so then so what yeah and i mean it's kind of that esoteric and that strange uh but it was fascinating you know uh, who i met uh, at est uh, <laughs> yeah greg brady uh, it was funny he was about a year older than me he was there with a woman who was like almost my mom's age i thought man this guy is really something yeah so anyway big three love work religion and and those are the ones that are really the kind of central topics there's self-realization programs cults of which est was not a cult but getting there right the landmark forum is a cult and, and notice you can click on these links as i said in the previous lecture and check it out est scientology is a big one that still exists right and, and what what is for example so we seek to explain understand align to to improve our being in the world Zenu, sometimes Zemu, is introduced as an alien ruler of the Galactic Confederacy, who 75 million years ago brought billions of people to Earth in a spacecraft resembling a DC-8, right, and stacked them around volcanoes, blew them up with hydrogen bombs, and the souls clustered together and stuck to the bodies of the living. The Scientologists believe that the alien souls continue to do this today, sticking to us, causing all kinds of various physical ill effects in modern-day humans. L. Ron Hubbard, what he called these cluster these clustered beings, body thetans, and advanced uh, levels uh, place considerable emphasis on isolating them and neutralizing their ill effects so that we can function better in the world. Okay, this is a compelling narrative, right? <laughs> maybe, maybe not. But the controversy involving the church and its critics, some of them include, you know, hey, we're going to do this theta, thetan removal process, but the Scientology's disconnection policy. The idea is, what if you went home? You go home right now and tell your parents this story about the alien beings and the DC-8s, the nuclear explosion, and you say, Mom and Dad, look, here's the deal. Or you say, Brother, Sister, you know, I'm joining this group, and I'm going to rid myself of the Thetans, and you should do it too. And they're going to look at you and go, say, what? And, and, you know, this necessitates for Scientology kind of this disconnection policy in which members are encouraged to cut off contact with friends or family who are going to be considered antagonistic, you know, and antagonistic means, have you really thought this through? Are you a nut or, or what have you been smoking, right? So the search for direction underlies all of these, though. So it, it began in the 1960s with a seminal work, I'm Okay, You're Okay, right? And that's kind of a cool book, actually. Because what it was talking about is, you know, we're different, and I'm okay, and you're okay simultaneously. We don't have to be the same, and we don't have to look at the world the same way. And it kind of grew into this idea of transactional analysis, that, that when we partner, friendship, romantically, whatever, that, that we're in a transaction, an ongoing transaction, and to understand what's going on, we analyze the transaction. And ultimately, we're standing on even ground, that is, I'm okay, you're okay. Right? Now, the industry, the self-help movement, relies on repeat customers. So people don't just buy one book and then call it good. People who you know, buy self-help books tend to buy multiple books over time that they keep changing uh, what interests them. Much of the advice is simply repackaged common sense. Right? And, and many, if not, of the authors have any real qualifications to be writing these books, other than they want to make the money from writing the book. And this will be part of your assignment then, is to talk about the author and what are their qualifications for writing this book. Because one of the first things that we need to do is understand who is this, what is their background, because are they justified in directing me at all, right? So when you look at like transactional analysis, and when we're looking at, at I'm okay, you're okay, you can see the, the matrix here, I'm okay, you're not okay. And that means I keep you in the one down position, right? So, and, and but the, then the other way could be, uh, I'm not okay, but, uh, but you're okay. Uh, and, and then that means that the other person is in the one-up position. This is a fascinating concept. And I mean, it's, it's 
interesting now what does it mean and how it can be applied that that's another story but when you look at relationships do you tend to for the example want a relationship where both people are okay or do you want to kind of you look for someone who's kind of a little lower than you so you can maintain the one-up position and that can be a huge self-esteem boost stay tuned because we're going to talk about self-esteem uh, quite a quite a bit in this course so now the search for direction movement then the, the improvement market in 2016 was 9.9 .9 billion and that's a growth of 4.3 percent since uh, 2011 right that growth was uh, mainly hurt by weak performance in infomercials and commercial diet programs 5.6 average gain though on an annual basis from 2016 to 2022 where the the market value should increase to about 13.2 billion that's a huge amount of money being invested in the self-help industry baby boomers were the main demographic Millennials are the future of the market and, and we'll see how it goes on down the line as people get older and it's usually when people get into their 30s that they often start asking that question is this all there is and the self-help movement becomes increasingly attractive right? yeah. self-help criticism from Salerno uh, he he's the, wrote the book Sham, right? And argues there's two camps of self-help. One is victimization, and, and this allows for people who are prone to victimization to be encouraged in their victimization, rationalizations, excuses, right? Nothing is your fault. You didn't make yourself this way, right? And, and it often stresses codependency and, and relationship addiction, right? And often, you know, with codependency, we find someone who's got their issues, and I got my issues issues and if I don't uh, frickin hassle you too much about your issues then you don't hassle me too much about my issues and are good having our issues right so uh, but but it really is a victim's point of view so some of the self-help books operate from this hey you're okay because this happens to all of us and we're just victims of this and we learn to uh, deal uh, now, the other possibility then is uh, the empowerment. You're fully responsible for what you do. And this is kind of the authoritarian gurus that, that tell us, right, uh, basically that you're responsible. And if your life is shit, then you need to clean up that mess, right? Because it's your fault and it's always been your fault. Now, notice the truth is going to be different in so many situations. And it's likely to be a combination of the two or perhaps neither, right? So, the empowerment gurus tend to be authoritarians who invite others to merge with them. So, Dr. Phil, we watch Dr. Phil, I hope not, unless you're doing it for the entertainment value, but he's always telling people what is right, what is wrong, and many people suck that up because they are not in a position to make the choice for themselves, which is kind of ironic. Let's talk about the background of some of these experts. And again, when you're doing your assignment, I want you to spend some time, as it says in the prompt, to tell me about these people. What's their story? What's their backstory, right? Dr. Phil, he began, Oprah was a big, you know, Dr. Phil fan back in the day. And that's a long time ago, right? And he was good. He'd come on Oprah and he'd tell people what to do. Now, what was Dr. Phil's education? It was neuropsychology. Well, okay, but you know, I'm not going to be too harsh about that because Sigmund Freud was a neurologist. I mean, so uh, came out of that tradition as possible. But fun fact, he was thrown out of the APA. Not Freud. The APA didn't exist for Freud, right? Dr. Phil was thrown out of the APA. Why? Because he was having fun with his patients, his clients, right? He's abusing the doctor-patient privilege. I don't know that this is a guy who should be telling me how to live my life if he doesn't do a very good job living his own life, right? Or necessarily following his own advice. Dr. John Gray wrote the book, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. Very popular course. I mean, book. What was his education? He took some correspondence courses. Now, <laughs> I know we're in an online environment, and maybe I shouldn't dish on that shit. And I will say this. Back when I was doing distance college, way back when, when I was working at the paper mill, 20 years ago, one of the toughest courses I ever took was a correspondence course. It was at a University of Minnesota, and it was a, a literature course. And oh my God, the teacher was amazing. He was great, but man, he made me work so hard. And we read some amazing pieces of work. Uh, Soren Kierkegaard, uh, Fear and Trembling, was one of the most notable 
uh, some work by Nietzsche, but man, and I would send great papers to him, and he'd say, yeah, this is a great paper, but I want you to make all these changes, and I'm like, well, dude, it's a great paper, just slap a grade on it, and let's be done with it. No, he was a monster, but I learned a tremendous amount, so I won't dish on, on necessarily correspondence or online courses. Dr. Laura Schlesinger uh, had a, a radio show. She presented herself as a psychologist or psychiatrist, whatever. Um, she bashed people on the radio, and she was kind of one of these totalitarians. You screwed up your life, you know, kind of in the vein of Judge Judy, right? She had a doctorate in physiology, not even psychology. She was in no way qualified to do this. She had a master's in marriage and family uh, counseling. She hadn't maintained uh, her any kind of qualifications, certifications since 83. Uh, the, the nude pictures of her that were released online taken by an ex-boyfriend, that was uh, kind of a hit on her. She had two affairs uh, in both cases with someone who was married, so her relationship advice might be taken with a grain of salt, right? Tony Robbins, right? And uh, the power, you know, uh, and Tony Robbins is a dynamic speaker. Man, he gets people all jacked up and, and not necessarily to bad ends. It's not the issue. Popular books, seminars, consulting, life coaching. He makes money hand over fist, right? This guy's a multimillionaire. Education, hard to track down. Really hard to track down. Best people can tell is maybe he has a high school diploma. And the funny thing is, if someone has the educational qualifications, believe me, you can find them and you can follow them quite you can find them quite readily. You want to know what my educational background is? Man, I'll, I'll put it out there because I worked my ass off to get that, right? I sweated out the social psychology program here at Ohio State for six and two-thirds years to get my PhD. I will shout it from the rooftops because it was one of my major accomplishments in life, right? So people who got the degrees will put them right out front there. If you can't find their background, easy, Emily. She's knocking stuff around, right? Did she knock us out of focus? Maybe a little bit. Um, so he was a Glendora High School president, so he's got some leadership skills, right? Four million uh, seminar attendees annually. This guy is big time, right? So need more help making choices? One of my pet peeves in the world is the advertising industry. Where else can you charge people to tell them what to do? Because remember, every product that you buy that was advertised, the advertising cost for that product is built into the price. So when they tell me to drink Coca-Cola and they show me that can of Coca-Cola and they spend literally hundreds of millions of dollars a year on advertising for Coca-Cola, I'm the one who's paying that. And to me, that's just so crazy because I'm paying to convince me to purchase the product. Wow. Advertising is an amazing process. Right? So, advertisers want to convince you their product is the right choice to make you happy. Often they're selling happiness. So when we look at the blue pill or the red pill, <laughs> advertisers tell you which is the better option. Right? And notice, for a lot of us, it's a lot easier to live that way. Just tell me what I need to do. I don't want to think about it. It's exhausting. Right? So make the right choice. Diamond rings for engagement. Right? Make the right choice. So happiness becomes a lucrative business. Right? The, 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 uh, the, they say the key to happiness is cheaper long distance service. At least A&T and T does. But Fruit of the Loom uh, says the key to happiness is nice undies. On the other hand, Pillsbury, sa uh, Pillsbury says, so everyone's got the key to our happiness and they're going to sell us the key to the happiness in the price of the product that we buy. So cheer, and look at some of the names of products. Cheer. How many of you love doing laundry? How many of you feel cheerful doing laundry, right? Or how about doing dishes, right? So joy, do you experience joy doing the dishes? Actually, I kind of like doing the dishes. We don't have a dishwasher. Isn't that a warm, soapy water and sticking your hands in it? I find kind of cool. But I'm a freak. I'll admit it right off the bat, right? So Clinique happy. <laughs> Right, and, and look at what promises it if you buy this product, right? So, uh, or or Macy's happy, right? Or, or for a mere fifty thousand dollars, you can afford the joy too, and, and buying this particular car, etc. Or, or are you happy yet? And, and this becomes the idea, and this is what advertisers bank on. So the standards we must live by. Uh, think about it. Uh, I came across this story and. 
I made the mistake of not downloading it because now it's, it doesn't seem to be available anymore. You can try the link, but I don't think I don't think the link works anymore. So I, I go to an all-girls high school. The student reports, and, and every senior gets a new student ID. We had gotten one in the beginning of the school year. We're, we're all unsure as to why we were given a second. After close inspection, we realized that our photos had been retouched far past smoothing out blemishes. Here's a list of changes that this young lady reports to her picture. There was face smoothing, there was skin recoloring, there was lip recoloring, eyebrow smoothing and reshaping, and face thinning. So what does this tell a high school student who is especially vulnerable to issues of identity? What does this tell? Your picture ain't cutting it. This is a better picture because we've made these modifications to it, right? I was outraged. I have a round face that I grew up to love now. And think about that. Maybe she was teased about a round face, but she came to accept herself for who she was and then advertisers or these photo finishers come back and say, no, you ain't good enough. We're going to make you better. And this is what it's going to look like. So she was outraged. The new photo no longer looks like me, but rather a prettier twin sister. When we have our photos taken, we're flat out told our skin will be retouched to hide blemishes. Weren't told, though, that the more drastic changes were made. So on that note, let's stop for a second and we'll go to part two. Uh, and we'll be wrapping this one up pretty quick, believe it or not. I know.